once again here with an episode of Basic Concepts of Editing. We've already gone through several of the significant subjects relating to editing, and we particularly concentrated on Eisensteinian montage and Pudovkin's relations in the last episode. Now, whereas Eisenstein and Pudovkin were both students of Lev Kuleshov, it is intriguing to note that they went their separate ways. Eisenstein concentrated on montage and Pudovkin on? Relations. Correct, relations. Now let me ask you, name the five kinds of montage that Eisenstein has spoken of one by one. Metric montage. Rhythmic montage. Tonal montage. Overtonal montage. Intellectual montage. Absolutely correct, that's excellent. Now can you tell me about the five kinds of relations that Pudovkin has spoken of? Contrast, simultaneity, okay. parallelism, yes. late motif, and symbolism. Correct. Now is there any among these that you would like a further clarification about? Can you please explain the concept of late motif? Okay, fine. Now that's a very good question. Because basically late motif is not peculiar to cinema or even to editing. This word is used in the English language and in other European languages. Liet motif, although it's spelt L-E-I-T, it's pronounced liet motif, is also uh, referred to as motif. Now, you know the famous filmmaker Shottujit Rai, the Indian filmmaker, used several very significant motifs in a film called Charulata. A motif may be defined as an element which repeats itself with thematic import. With a view to expressing a particular theme, a certain element is repeated. Now let's look at Charulota. In Charulota, the first few minutes are almost entirely silent. And we see Charu in different situations. Now if I ask you, what do you think that the director, and indeed the author, Tagore, when he wrote Nostunir, what were they trying to convey in those first few minutes regarding the, the mental state of Charu? Yes? The loneliness of Charu. Absolutely correct. The loneliness of Charu. She is, in a sense, neglected by her husband. She lives in a palatial house. She has nothing to do. And in order to express this loneliness, Ray uses certain motifs. What are they? First is the haunting music, which repeats itself. Motif is often used in music. A particular line, a musical line, repeats itself. Like say in Chaplin's Limelight, I'll be loving you eternally. It repeats itself. Here also the music. Do you remember? In the title uh, sequence in which there's some embroidery done, there is music. And that's music from a Tagore song. And then in this, in this main text, the main tract, you first see what is known as a lornet. A lornet, L-O-R-G-N-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. What is a lornet, anyone? A lornet is a kind of a binocular. Uh, a binocular which was used by the Victorian ladies. And since, you know, Calcutta was the second city of the British Empire, the, the, the Victorian and British moors and customs had come down here. So she sees the world through the lornet. She is cloistered, and she can only see the world through that. So that's an important motive. Then, you know, her equipment for embroidery, that's a motive. All of these convey her loneliness. And there are several other motives. Uh, she takes betel, that's pan. You know, what? how can she spend her time? It is these motives which convey her loneliness. Now, Pudovkin says that we use a montage in a particular way in which you say that the relationship which is achieved, in this case it's not montage but relation, that relationship is like a motif. So it's a montage that conveys a kind of repetition. So there's a repetition. And this repetition is not without meaning. The repetition has thematic import. In the case of Charulota, the thematic import was loneliness. In the case of, say, Pudovkin's mother, it's the, it's the feeling of a child for a mother. 
It's the intense emotional feeling which is conveyed through those cuts, which are like liet motifs. Now we move forward in this episode, the last in the series of basic concepts, where I'll talk about certain very specific principles of editing. So principles of editing is what we're going to talk about. First principle that I'd like to speak of is called screen direction. We've already explained that film is like reality. Film is an asymptote of reality, but film is not reality. The moment you shoot from within a lens, you are changing that reality. Therefore, there are certain rules that we do not apply in real life, but we need to apply in film so that the viewer is not con confused. The idea of editing is to present a narrative in a smooth flow so that the audience is not disturbed, so that they you know, are able to absorb the story so that you are able to communicate your story. So there should not be any pitfalls, any breaks, so that the story is uninterrupted. These principles of editing, particularly screen direction, will present the narrative in a smooth way and will not disturb the viewer. For example, suppose I place the camera here and you are a character, you are looking to the right of the camera. From my point of view, it's the right of the camera. From your point of view, it's to the left. Now, when you look to the right in one shot, the moment I move to the next shot, you should still be looking to the right. That is screen direction. Otherwise, the audience will suddenly find that you're looking in the opposite direction, and it's confusing for them. So maintain the screen direction. I'll give you an example where the screen direction is violated. Just to give you an example. Do you remember Pothir Panchali again? Do you remember the famous train sequence? Opu and Durga see the train for the first time. You'll find that the train is moving on the screen from the right to the left in one shot, then from the right to the left in another shot, and then all of a sudden when they actually see the train from close, it moves from left to right. The screen direction is violated. Was well, Shotir Fry making a mistake here? Or is it an exception that proves the rule? My answer, I don't know. But my answer to this is that if you look at that shot very carefully, you will find that whereas Opu and Durga were in the foreground of the camera and the train was in the background moving from right to left, in the last shot, the train moving from left to right is in the foreground and Opu and Durga are in the background coming towards the camera. So he's changed the camera angle completely in a 360 degree arc. Normally, this would be called a mistake in Hollywood parlance. But perhaps the effect of seeing the train for the first time was so shocking, so disorienting, that maybe Ray felt that the audience also needed to be disoriented and therefore the train moves from left to right. I think it's a brilliant example, but it also illustrates the rules and how you can break the rules and how you may not break the rules. So screen direction is the first of these principles. Another principle which is very closely related to screen direction is the rule of the imaginary line. You can never achieve proper editing if the shot is not taken properly. The taking of the shot is the responsibility of the director. Just as montage is in the domain of the editor, mise-en-scene is in the domain of the director. Now, what is mise-en-scene? Mise-en-scene is another French word, and it's derived from theater. It literally means putting into a scene. Therefore, all that you put into a scene, that means the location, the sets, the props, the lights, the characters, the makeup, the dialogue, everything, and the camera, and the camera angles. So in order to maintain the imaginary line, you need to take the shot correctly. It's maintaining the 180 degree line. Suppose this is character A. He's sitting at a table on a chair and character B here. And they're talking to each other. And this is a dialogue sequence. This is a table, right? Now I have camera position one here. Camera position two here. Camera position three here. Now, in all of these, I draw an imaginary line between A and B. And 
I don't cross this line at all. All the shots that I take are on this side of the line. By doing that, I always maintain, so far as the viewer is concerned, that B is to the right of A and A is to the left of B. The moment I cross the 180 degree line, that is I move into 240 degrees or 300 degrees, and I take a camera position here, let's say 4, A was to the left of B will suddenly become A to the right of B and will completely disorient the spectator. They were seeing a character sitting in a particular way and suddenly they see the character sitting in a, in a different way. Actually, the character is still sitting in that way. But because I changed the camera, it seems like a continuity jerk. It is not a continuity jerk, but my shifting of the camera to a wrong position gives the impression that it's a continuity jerk. So you must always take all the shots in the sequence on this side of the line. Now the question is, can you not cross the line? Well, rules are meant to be broken. You can always break them. But there are methods of breaking the rules also. You have to break the rule in a very unobtrusive manner because we are really doing decoupage classique, seamless transitions. Use a track shot. Use the camera on a trolley and move from one side to the other, either a round trolley or a straight trolley. And using the trolley, move to the other side, take the angle. And now, once you've come there, take all the angles on the other side. Correct? So you can break the line by using a trolley shot. Now, there's more to this. It's not as simple as all that. With regard to breaking the line, there are some film directors who do break the line. This is a Japanese director called Yasujiro Ozu. Yasujiro Ozu who doesn't work in a 180 degrees arc. He works in a 360 degrees arc. So he will match cut. He will match on action, but he'll constantly break the line. This is because Ozu has a non-classical approach towards editing and towards filmmaking. His entire filmmaking is anti-Hollywood, and therefore he breaks the line. Now. But suppose for the moment we stay within the ambit of Hollywood and work for decoupage classique, work for seamless transitions. Let me ask you, suppose instead of two characters, there are three characters. Then how will you devise the line? Look at it here. Character here A, character here B, character here C. Now where is the line? A connecting B connecting C. Mm, A connecting C. Then? And A connecting B? No. no. There will be three lines. A, B, this is one line you have to maintain. B, C, this is one line you have to maintain. And A, C. Oh. So whenever you take shots of A from the point of view of C, maintain the line between A and C. Whenever you take shots of B from the point of view of A, maintain the line between A and B. Whenever you take shots of B from the point of view of C, maintain the line between B and C, and vice versa in each case. So in the case of three characters or four characters, there will be as many lines between characters. You must, while taking, have the camera placed at the correct point, and while editing also, you must know that the line has to be maintained. Now suppose the director makes a mistake while shooting the shot. What can the editor do? How can he salvage the situation? How do you think he can save the situation? Do you have any idea? He can save the situation by using what is known as a cutaway. A cutaway is a shot that temporarily distracts the spectator. That cutaway relates to the action. For example, you're sitting on a table and there's a glass of water. You cut to the glass of water and then when you come back, the viewer will have forgotten who was to the right and who was to the left, and your mistakenly taken shot can be used. Although this is not very good technique, you know, it doesn't look very nice on the screen. But since you have nothing else to do, you have a force to use a cutaway. So to re revise this, this is very important. One of the basic principles of editing, 
screen direction to be maintained all the time. A train moving, you move out of the room, you move on the road, you go home. Then the viewer will feel that you're moving towards some place. The moment you show the opposite direction, the viewer will feel you're backtracking. Mm -hmm. So screen direction. More sophisticated than screen direction is the imaginary line. When two persons are talking, it is an imaginary line drawn between the two. You must work in a 180 degree arc. Keep the camera always to one side of that 180 degree line and compose all your angles, including your track forwards and parallel tracks. If you want to cross the line, you can do so in several ways. One is, you can just cross the line. It'll be a mistake, according to Hollywood. But Yasujiro Ozu, who has developed a non-classical approach towards editing, he constantly crosses the line. So in his case, that's his style. But if I am to maintain Hollywood, maintain decoupage classique, maintain this principle of seamless transitions, then I need to use a track. And through the track, I need to cross the line. And then when I go to the other side of the line, well, I can take as many shots as I like, but I shouldn't come back to this side again. That's the way of crossing the line. If there are more than two characters, then if there are three characters, there will be three lines. And the point of view shots of the respective characters will be determined by the line drawn between the two of them. This basically is the concept of screen direction and imaginary line, one of the most important principles of editing. Now let's move to the next principle, and that is match cutting and jump cutting. Do you have any idea at all about a match cut? There is an example from the birds, Hitchcock's birds, uh, where the character, uh, the female protagonist, is talking to another uh, female character in the film. Uh, a phone uh, call comes and uh, she picks up the phone. And then and uh, then the protagonist is seen to be talking in the background uh, while she picks up the phone of the female character. And then a close-up, match cutting to the close-up of the character. Okay, that's not bad. It's a famous sequence with Tippi Hedron in Birds by Alfred Hitchcock. For a match cut, and you will please note, may be defined as a cut in which the action that flows from, let us say, a long shot into a medium shot is perfectly matched and reflects that one continuous piece of action is shown from two different angles or perspectives. How do you achieve this perfect match? There are several methods. One, while taking, you repeat the entire action, first thing. While shooting the shot, take it in long shot, take it in medium shot. Or take it in medium shot, take it in close up. One. Second, make sure that when you take the second shot, the continuity is perfectly maintained. Continuity is very important to the director, very important to the editor. That is, I'm holding it with my left hand. I should still be holding it in my left hand in the next shot. I should hold it exactly as I did. The light should be exactly the same. And I should be doing exactly the same action. Right. When you cut from one to the other, make sure that there is a difference in the magnification. What do I mean by this? Difference in the magnification. What I mean? Difference between the two shots. Uh, in what sense? What do I mean by magnification? One shot may be taken in a uh, mid-shot, uh, mid another would be a close-up of the character. Excellent. That's a very good answer. That means the volume, how close it is, the magnification. If I come close, you get magnified. If I go away from you, it becomes longer. There must be a difference in magnification. If it's close in magnification, it'll jerk. So this is a very strange thing. Don't try to make the two shots exactly like they, I mean, like they're similar. Don't make them similar. Make them dissimilar. Change in magnification and change in angle. The angle of the camera must at least change by 30 degrees. Only then will the match cut be effective. Change in magnification, change in angle, repeat both the shots, 
make sure that the continuity is perfectly maintained and finally cut on movement that masks the cut cut it while i'm moving cut it on movement it makes it a very smooth match cut sometimes you may need to overlap a few frames say two or three frames that makes it even more smooth that means repeat a few frames from this shot to the other repeat a few that makes it a perfect match cut okay now what is a jump cut now, there is no continuity in space and time between two shots that's excellent basically the meaning of jump cut has changed over the ages you know it started changing with jean luc godard but now in this postmodern era in the age of digital video and lightweight equipment with experimental video coming in the entire lexicon the entire dictionary of cinematic terms has changed video now has occupied a very important position in our society so much so that video has been the subject of many postmodern lectures even the famous philosopher jean baudrillard has spoken about video as has frederick jameson therefore the meanings of these terms which have come from film and are now being used in television and video has changed so there's not just one meaning of jump cut when godard used jump cut for the first time in a film called breathless, breathless. abu the souffle made in 1960 godard was part of a very important film movement called the nouvelle vague the new wave and he had people like françois truffaut claude chabrol eric romer and jacques rivet all of whom were writing for Cahiers du Cinéma, which was edited by André Bazin. At that time, when he came up with Breathless, he used the jump cut like this. You find the main character of Michel Poicard in Breathless involved in several actions with the intermediary action being snipped off. Like, for example, you're in a room at this point of time, cut to, you're suddenly in the room there. There's no showing of the character moving from this point to the other. That was a jump cut. It was an abrupt cut, change in space. An abrupt cut, a change in time. That was the original meaning of jump cut. But Goddard rarely repeated this, and other filmmakers did not use the jump cut with such jarring effect anymore. For example, you are sitting here, cut to your sitting here. This is not used so much, but this is the original meaning of jump cut, an abrupt cut or a change in time, an abrupt cut or a change in space within the same scene. A jump cut will be effective within the scene. It will not be effective outside the scene, because in any case, when you cut from one scene to the other, you change in time, or you change in space, or you change both. Do you understand? So in any case, moving from one scene to the other would have a cut. But a jump cut is within the same scene. That's how Goddard used it. But since then, the meaning has changed. And nowadays, we have jump cuts with elements of match. It might be a graphic match, although you're changing the space of the time like Ozu does. It might be a match like the example from Shole that I spoke of in the earlier episode of Gabbar Singh pointing his rifle and about to fire. It is a jump cut because it moves to that wheel of the train with its pistons puffing. It's a jump cut with elements of match. A sound bridge has helped in that case. So jump cuts now have elements of match, and mat cuts also have elements of jump. But basically, the jump cut lacks the smoothness, the continuity, the maintenance of time and space which a match cut has. And a jump cut might be very effective. For example, if you stay in a hostel, like I used to, I was a film institute student, and every morning, you know, there was the daily routine, morning routine of shaving and, you know, washing your face. Suppose I show my full face full of lather here. And I take the razor, and I'm about to shave. As I do that, cut to me washing my face. It's a jump cut. It's very effective. I don't need to show myself completely shaving and then washing. So this is a jump cut which can be very effective. Another thing is that sometimes the jump cuts can have sound overlaps. I am to go to the bathroom. Now I get out of my room and you show me walking down the corridor. Suddenly, the tap water starts and you cut to me washing my face. So reality says that the water would start only after I go to the bathroom and start washing my face. But here, I've already started the water. So that sound overlap smoothens the cut, which is a jump cut. 
So we are going to end this particular episode, but I'll make a quick recapitulation with regard to the second half. That is basically, we started off with screen direction. That's very important. Please study Technique of Film Editing by Carol Rice. That's the book which will tell you all about screen direction. Match cuts, jump cuts, and above all, the imaginary line. The imaginary line is very important in general if you want to be filmmakers or even if you want to be editors. I'll just end by saying that, as I told you, this is the age of video and computers and the net. But we cannot forget where it all started. It started from Lumiere. And he created what was known as the cinematograph. That was his machine, which was a shooting machine, a camera. It was also a projector. Edison started off with a kinetoscope, which was more of uh, a shooting machine. And he had a separate projection machine. And editing machines were developed. So we cannot forget the primitive editing machine, which we will go into in the next episode. And they are, please note, we begin with a machine called the Pick Sync or the Eddy Sync. We follow it up with a machine called the Moviola. The Moviola is what is known as a vertical editing machine. And then there's the Steenbeck, which is the horizontal editing machine. For a long time, people were editing on Steenbecks. And finally, they came into the non-linear domain. That is, once again, film was united with video and computers. And uh, that's how non-linear started. But that is what we will do in the next episode.